Welcome to the Dash Arts Podcast, seeing the world through an artistic lens. I'm Josephine Burton. I'm Rachel Head. I never know who's going to say something next. (laughs) (laughs) And this is our podcast on Albion. Thank you for speaking to me. So obviously this episode is looking at Albion and sort of ties in the work that we've been doing on storytelling and mythology, looking forward to um, Dash's new season and sort of English folklore and what it means to be English. Tell me a little bit about um, your interest in Albion, like where that came from. So we've just come to the end at the end of 2022 of our season of work thinking about what it means to be European. And it began really because of the the referendum result in 2018, whatever it was, years ago, 2016, when I was quite curious about why the UK had sort of officially rejected this European identity and what the European identity meant. And so the next sort of five years of Dash's life was spent exploring that more. What does it mean to be European? Who gets to be, you, you know, what are the borders of Europe and who gets to define themselves as as being within it or without it. And that kind of took over our life. It uh, led us through COVID. Uh, We did lots of Dash cafes before COVID and then podcasts during COVID. And it culminated at the end of 2022 with Maruf and I and Hattie creating Dido's Bar, which was really inspired by Maruf's own journey to become European. As I sort of watched and read and learnt and listened to a lot of people over the last few years, exploring what, what, what it means to be European, and I suppose how, how our European kind of ness is part of British identity, it, it started to be sort of exploring what else was part of British identity. And I was watching uh, the endless conversations around devolution and um, uh, Northern Ireland, and we're going on with this protocol, which is still ongoing today, although it looks like they might be sort of resolving it in some ways. I have no idea what that means, but there's some resolution coming. And also Scottish identity, which again looks like it's a bit bit of a, it's again a slight strange impasse with Nicola Sturgeon resigning. So it's a curious time for identity across the British Isles. But there is a clear sense of being other in Britain if you are Irish or if you are Scottish or if you're Welsh. And it leaves a little bit of a of kind of vacuum in the middle of what Englishness means. And um, it's certainly a part of of an identity if you live in the British, if within the England borders, is Englishness. And, and I just that's the journey of the next couple of years is exploring what Englishness means and um, who gets to be called English. So that's the that's the kind of the journey, and I'm not quite sure on on exactly where it goes and how long it will go for. And what does Albion mean to you? <sighs> what does Albion mean to me? Um, to me, it is a sort of beautiful, fictitious word for a for an imagined country, a fictional country which could be the British Isles, could be England. I think probably could be Ireland, could be anywhere that crops up in literature and storytelling and is entirely fictional and idealised and conceived. And I, I, my my insight is that that um, projection of an identity that comes through an Albion, which is entirely fictional, is also quite connected to a projection of an English identity that we don't really, none of us really fully understand. And if we're going to go on a, on a journey to dream of who we are or who we could be and a country in which we might live, um, Albion seemed like a very good title to give it. It's hard to talk about sort of, a, you know, what it means to be English without thinking about the sort of the very nationalistic connotations of describing yourself as English rather than British. You know, the English flag itself has become synonymous with racism. I was listening to something the other day that was saying that the survey results, like the big census results that they ha- that happens every in 10 years in the UK, in this year's results, they were like analysing it. And they were saying, strangely, that more people in, in within the English borders define themselves as British than English this year. And it was the first time that it ever happened. And um, part there was a sort of everyone was quite curious about it and whether that was a sort of a sign and this, that, dis- that sense of discomfort about identifying as English was sort of more, it's quite prevalent everywhere but then there was someone else saying yeah but you know what they switched the order of the questions around on the census sheet so Englishness was below Britishness and it tends to be most people tend to take the first box so they weren't 100% sure but I, I kind of love the story that actually it's not just it's not just you and me feeling that the English is sort of synonymous with a, a kind of rose-tinted nostalgia of a time when the country was slightly more I don't know traditional small c conservative you know if you're I, I have a certain discomfort personally with the word English for all of those reasons and I really want to explore that and break it down because to me Englishness today is diverse internationally facing 
the language is spoken by more people outside the British Isles than inside it by like a factor of about 100. It's interesting what you said about sort of devolution, because I do think that that plays has, I think that's playing a really large part in the popularity of folklore. And obviously that a lot of that is tied to the sort of resurgence of popularity in, in Greek mythology, but also the like cultural tension that I think we're all still working through from from devolution what is left of Englishness and how do we look at Englishness in a way that is not just that history myth and folklore is amazing for understanding how we act in times of great transition or great change and so I wonder whether looking back to that gives us a a different history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gives us an well, I think it I think we need something we we need new cultural uh symbols and 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 identifiers. I mean I also wonder if if there's a sense that we will bypass Englishness and move even more na- you know even become even narrower in our sense of def- self-definition. So we'll end up with uh you know being clearly defining as Londoners or Cornish or Yorkshires. Uh, so so the point of, as part of Albion, as part of our season of work, we are about to embark on a new series of, a new a series of workshops um, that will lead to a project that we're calling the Public House, which is um, an attempt to uh, go around the country with some amazing uh, academics and, and and a play, wonderful playwright called Jude, called Jude Christian to go and listen um, to to people in small communities across England. And uh, we're going to go with these amazing academics because they are brilliant experts at public speaking and rhetoric. And they truly believe that anyone should and can have speak powerfully about something that they feel is important to them. And we all have the skills inside them. Um, and they've got this amazing workshop that they've been doing in different parts of, in the kind of academic circles and with speech writers about how you write a good speech. And what we're going to do is we're going to go into little communities across England to work with people to find out what's meaningful and important for them locally, and then support them in providing the tools, the speaking tools to be able to um, write a short, powerful speech about what they want to change in their community and and give them the opportunity, you know, by giving them these tools in order to speak, give them the opportunities to be able to speak out locally to make change. So this podcast and this episode is really sort of a jumping off point, a scratching the surface of, of Englishness and looking at identity and how that works. What I really would love to learn through 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 this podcast is learning about Albion and who and the kind of the identity of what Albion really means. <laughs> is is use this as a jumping off point um to explore over the next few years through the podcasts you know like what 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 are our roots what kind of what are those sort of cultural symbols that we could potentially be drawing on to understand who we are today and um, and this is the beginning of that journey and I can't wait to learn through this podcast a little bit more and then um and then go on a bit of a journey through the podcast over the next couple of years to learn a little bit more about different ways we could tell stories about ourselves to help us understand who we are. My first port of call was to speak with Carolyn Larrington, an author and a professor of medieval English language and literature, who I heard on a brilliant BBC Sound series, The Law of the Land, about British folklore. So I guess what I'm hoping that you'll be able to shed some light on for me is this is the beginning of the journey of Albion, which is going to be a whole new season of work for Dash, with beginning with this one podcast episode about the origins of the word. It seems to be linked to so many different things. Obviously, there's the story about the White Cliffs of Dover, but then it's also the name of, of these giants that that came to our, this island after a great flood and it's linked to Arthurian legend, which I find really fascinating. And I was wondering if you could give us a bit of context on that as much as is possible. I know that's quite a big question. The earliest mention of Albion is as a name that's derived from a princess called Albina. And Albina and her many sisters are all married off to husbands that they find rather disagreeable. And so they take counsel together and decide to murder their husbands. And Albina, supposedly, in one version, she tells her father of the plan and the women are thwarted, but they're all put in the boat and sent out to sea. In another version, Albina is the ringleader. So they all make off on this boat and end up on the shores of the island that would later become Britain. 
and they find it deserted and this is fine, they think, and they're quite happy for a while. But then they begin to miss having men around the place and this lays them open to um, sexual predation or sexual liaisons at any rate with demons who are wandering around invisible. And Albina and her sisters therefore give birth to a race of giants. And the giants are the only inhabitants of the land when Brutus turns up sometime later. And it's Brutus's job to eliminate the giants. These include well-known figures like Gog and Magog, um, who are biblical giants, but who are also um, part of English folklore. And as a result, Brutus gets to rename the island Britain in his own honour and kind of displaces Albion, named after Albina. So it's an interesting example of the, the masculine order replacing the, the kind of feminine anarchy that, uh, that lies behind the, the origins of the island being populated. So that's a story that we have from roughly the 12th, 13th century. Um, but we also have, as I understand it, a rather later early modern version in which Albion is simply the son of the sea god Neptune and becomes associated with the island. Neptune has so many children, they all spread out across the, the seas of the, and rivers of the world. And Albion takes charge of this island and looks after its waterways in particular and is associated with um, naval victories. So he's a kind of patron deity that uh, is behind the success or otherwise of the British Navy. But I don't think you get that till the early modern period. And you have Michael Drayton's Polly Albion, which is a kind of conspectus of different parts of the British Isles, though he didn't manage to include everything in it. And that rather depends on this idea that Albion or Albion is, is sort of multiple. When you say it, um, the son of the sea god Neptune, so it was my understanding that Albion was the oldest word for England. Well, it seems to be synonymous with England, but it's not that old. Um, the oldest name that we have for the island is Britain, and that's attested by the what it's called in in the Celtic languages. And you have to understand that the oldest name really means the oldest term that we find written down anywhere. So it depends who's doing the writing. But we have Britain, first of all, in um, the earliest Latin texts, which are the first texts that actually write anything about the islands. And then we have the idea of England, once the Angles and the Saxons get here. And we have a, a whole group of different kingdoms which become united in the idea of Englaland, which is then England. But then, of course, Wales, which is a name that comes from Anglo-Saxon, and Scotland are, are different um, concepts in, in that argument. So Albion isn't really attested until after the Norman Conquest. So it's not the oldest name by any means. But it does seem to be one that's associated with the, the legendary heritage of the islands, I think, or in fact of England. I, I think because the... Uh, other names like England and Britain have political and historical and um, more concrete associations, whereas Albion is something that you can very much project your own sort of fantasies onto. Yes, and I think arguably that's sort of what we're looking at. We're struggling with the idea, like a lot of people, I think, of what it means to be English mm -hmm. now. Yeah, I think that's that's probably right. What what becomes difficult, I think, if you're trying to reclaim a spe specifically English heritage, is the basically the lack of myths that really belong in the English landscape, as opposed to Scottish and Welsh, where you have a great deal more material. And so our, our English myths are quite local, I think, and are really folk tales and, and local legends rather than something that's like Norse myth or Greek myth that has a, a big systematic um, notion of gods and heroes. So our, our mythology is more legendary and it's, it's smaller scale, I think, and very much attached to place. So you teach Old and Middle English literature. Yeah. Do we see any mentions of Albion at all throughout that sort of period? 
I think it's the preface to an Anglo-Norman translation of Geoffrey of Monmouth that gives us the Albina story. But um, apart from that, it's just not common in Middle English. I wonder why it's become something more recently. I Well, I think I'd probably put it Sorry. down to, to um, partly to Michael Drayton's Polly Albion as being um, a work that, because it's quite compendious, it was kind of a description of the islands, but it had legends and history and, and so on woven into it. Um, I think that was part of the popularisation of the name. And then also William Blake pounces on Albion as a term which is distinct from Britain and England and which allows him to elaborate the kind of view that um, that he has in his poem Jerusalem, um, which is almost our unofficial national anthem, that this may be the land where there are dark satanic mills coming coming into existence as industrialization is taking place. But at the same time, it's still green and pleasant. There's still something kind of paradise-like about England that is worth trying to save and worth trying to mystify, to remind us that maybe Jesus did come to England. Maybe England is a holy land at some level. And even if we can't be sure that Jesus ever came to England, which is a a rather more recent um, mythological invention, yet the land is still somehow sacred. Carolyn gave me a lot to think about, but there were two main strands which jumped out at me when trying to understand the sort of multifaceted definitions of Albion. William Blake and the Albina myth. I found the Albina myth fascinating and it led me down a rabbit hole of looking at how myth and folklore can be used to fill in historical gaps. I started researching artists creating work around English folklore and found Steffi Harrop's show, The Queen of Albion. Steffi is a storyteller who comes highly recommended to me by Claire Murphy and Alice Torrance from our previous episode on storytelling. She's an academic, a writer, an incredible performer And I asked her to tell me a little bit about why she was interested in the Albina myth specifically. Uh, My latest storytelling show is called Queens of Albion, um, and it retells the legend of Albina, which is a, a medieval legend. And it's a story that was invented to backfill a gap in the, uh, kind of historical, mythic, historical Record. So there were lots of stories already circulating about how Britain was founded by Brutus, who was a, a grandson of Trojan Aeneas, who was a great grandson of the goddess Aphrodite. So giving kind of emerging Britain that kind of heroic classical lineage. But there was an issue with the story, which is that Brutus turns up and, spoilers, um, kills a whole bunch of giants. But that story never gets around to explaining where the giants come from. So the Albina legend is kind of invented retrospectively to explain how come there is an island full of giants at the kind of western end of the known world. You will probably spot immediately that the Albina legend is lovingly ripped off from kind of earlier Greek myths. So again, it is reaching towards those classical lineages. But it tells the story of usually around 30 sisters, the different versions give slightly different numbers. They're the daughters of um, a king in Greece or in Syria. Um, Occasionally, they're the daughters of a Roman emperor. And they are um, forced into marriages, which they do not choose to submit to. And in response to those forced marriages, they either plot to or actually do murder their husbands. And so we have these 30, 33, 29 sisters who violently refuse to be forced into marriage and as punishment are sent out to sea in a ship with no provisions, with no water, with no crew, with no maps, just thrust out into an unknown world. And it's the sea, it's the ocean, and it's particularly a great storm at sea that in the end delivers them to this, this empty island at the western edge of the world. And there they, uh, they live 
for a while. They live for a while as hunter gatherers, but gradually they, they want more for themselves. They decide that they want to become hunters because they want to eat meat. So they, uh, they become hunters, they eat meat. And as they eat meat, they start to develop other urges. Um, and again, depending upon the text and depending upon the ver- version of the story, they either voluntarily have sex with the kind of spirits or the devils that live on that island, or in quite a lot of versions, they involuntarily um, enter into some kind of uh, sexual activity with those creatures. And as a result, the giants of Albion are born. Can I just go back slightly to when you said it was created, basically created as an origin myth, by whom and and to what, for what demand? That's a really good question. If we think about where England is um, in the historical moment that these stories were emerging, you know, it it still hasn't quite got back on its feet after the Norman invasion. It's still working out how to become a country that has all these Germanic peoples, that now has kind of uh, Norman French peoples, that has kind of British and Celtic populations from before the Romans and probably has a few stray Romans knocking around as well. So it's it's a, a nation that is trying to find itself, that is trying to establish a kind of identity for itself at a really tumultuous political and cultural national moment. Um, and so it's a story that is created by poets, by writers, by educated peoples, by elite peoples. This is very much a a top-down piece of myth-making, which I think is quite interesting to consider. But it's a a story that is created, I think, with a political purpose, to give a sense of cohesion, to give a sense of, we are all one people, somehow, and this is where we come from. We have this lineage that we can trace that takes us back to the, the splendors of the classical world, that gives us this heroic um, slightly larger than life lineage. Well, with Queens of Albion, what did all that research teach you about the origins of the of the word Albion? It's really interesting, and I I don't think there are lots of stories. Certainly, if there are, I haven't come across them yet. Although maybe they're out there. Maybe I'm going to find them. But I feel like this is another way in which the Albina legend is sort of backfilling um, cultural material that is already there. So my understanding is that the word Albion was already in use before the Albina legend was created. So Albina is named after Albion rather than the other way around. So my understanding is that there, that Albion comes from the Latin, comes from Alba, uh, which is a way in which um, explorers from the the Roman world, the Latin speaking world, denoted this particular island. So there's an island at the western edge of the world. Some people believe in it. Some people think it's a myth. Certainly in the Greek world, some people think it's a myth, which is brilliant. Uh, you know, they think it's just sailor stories. But gradually it comes to acquire this, this name. It's Alba. It's the White Island. And scholars who have studied this more than me suggest that this is because of the the white cliffs because when you're approaching the island by boat that's that's what you see that's the characteristic things like, oh it's the white island okay brilliant so actually britain and i'm putting a question mark on that because i'm never quite sure what other word you can use hmm. for the island of albion it has this name alba albion and when the legends of how the giants got there are being written in the 13th and 14th century I, I feel like they took an opportunity to go, oh, well, we could, we can also explain the name. We can explain that. So they, they named the Princess Albina in order to give a legendary etymology to this name that is already there. Because there's already, as well, the story of, of Brutus naming Brutain, Brutain. So it kind of works analogously with that. It's like, well, yeah, he calls it. But if, what if this character gives it her name and that explains the Albanus, the whiteness? So I think that's what happened. Canon, canon appropriate. Absolutely, yeah. You work in Greek mythology as well. Um, Then did you sort of turn more to being interested in English, like folk stories? Yeah, I think that's right. I I did a PhD on Greek tragedy um, a long time ago now. So I loved that. But I was also really aware that I didn't want to work just with ancient Greek stories 
forever. I felt this real hunger, this appetite to work with stories that were closer to home, that explained some of the complexities and tensions of my own time and place, of my own culture. Um, and something I, I realized when I was working on Queens of Albion is that basically my adult life has been dominated by the consequences of devolution. You know, that moment at the end of the 90s when Scotland, when Wales got a measure of self-governance, when self-governance in Northern Ireland was you know, becoming a, a political reality. That was a, a really important moment. That was the moment at which I was coming into adulthood. And I really do feel that as an adult in England now, a lot of the cultural tension that I see, a lot of the uncertainty, a lot of the unease, a lot of the angst is us still working through that moment. It's still working through, well, who are the English? What is England as it sort of lets go of colonial possessions or, or acknowledges that colonial possessions have gone? You know, what, what is England today and how can English people use older stories, myths and legends to help us come to terms with, yes, this is a moment of transition, this is a moment of change. And our cultural history is full of moments of transition and change where we have eased ourselves through it and explained ourselves to ourselves using myth and using legend. So that's sort of where my work has taken me in the last 10 years or so. And how can we? What stories have you found useful in that? In that journey. For example, I think the Albina story, the story of the founding of Albion, the naming of Albion, because Albina is the eldest of the exiled sisters and she gives her name to the island. She says, I will name it after myself. This will be Albina's island. I think that is a brilliant one to think with about Englishness because it is so clearly an invented myth. It is so clearly a story where there was a group of people in a moment of crisis who went, Lads, we need to make a story. We need to make a story to make ourselves feel better, to make ourselves feel rooted, to make ourselves feel important in the world, because that's one of the things that, that myth and legend do. They give us a sense of importance and value. And uh, in the show, in my show, Queens of Albion, one of the things that I do that I think is so important is to say, this is a made up story. You know, this, this is not timeless. This was not here and we just happened to find it. We, we invented this to solve a problem. And if we could do that in the 12th century, in the 13th century, in the 14th century, why can we not do that in the 21st century? So one of the invitations I make in that show is to say to the audience, well, what, what stories would we like to tell now? What stories could we tell about ourselves, about our identity, about our relationship with the rest of the world that will make us feel better, but that might also make life a little bit more livable for all kinds of people. What if we use that idea to interpret England and the way we do our histories? And actually, does that show us something about ourselves and the way that we don't always want to look at the difficult bits? And we don't want to look at the scars and we don't want to look at the damage. You know, we want Laurence Olivier and shiny silver armour. You know, yes, please, we don't want necessarily to think about more, the more difficult parts. So bringing those multiple stories together builds toward this, this challenge, I think, to all of us as English people, as dreamers of England, of why do we choose to suppress some stories? Why do we choose to look away from certain stories? And what would it mean for the maybe the wholeness of our national imagination if we could be brave enough to look at some of the difficult stories, the scarred, the messy stories, as well as the ones that make us feel good about ourselves, the ones where we get to be the winners. How fantastically articulated, better than I could ever say it, but that's kind of what we're looking at, trying to think about Englishness and origin myths and what that says now about our identity and how to look at an English identity. And if you were going to give some advice on like the where to start with those stories, Obviously, you're clearly the best place to start. <laughs> but after that, are there any 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 particular that sort of jump out at you? Are like this person in history and, and this other story about them? Oh, that's interesting. I think maybe I wouldn't say a particular person or a particular mm. story, but I think there's a particular mindset that is really useful and really important. Um, and it's a, it's a storyteller's mindset because 
there's never one story. There's never one way to tell a story. You know, if you're working as a contemporary storyteller, if you're working with inspiration from oral traditions and oral practices, there is never one way. As soon as you start to research, what you always discover is, oh, there's this version, oh, there's this version. Oh my goodness, there, oh, have you seen this version? Oh my goodness, look what happens there. As soon as you start to dig, you discover multiplicity. And what's lovely about being a storyteller and working with storytellers and talking to storytellers is that that multiplicity is always a cue for excitement. It's, it's not a thing that makes storytellers anxious. And I think that's a really important habit of mind to, to make use of, because I think sometimes more broadly, sometimes in culture, if we start to discover multiplicity, if we start to discover there's another way of looking at that story, the the immediate response can be shut down, can be anxiety, can be, oh, I don't want there to be another, I, I want the right version, I, I want the proper version. And of course, the English education system for the last 10 years or so has, has really instilled that, that there's a correct version of every story, and somebody more powerful than you is going to tell you what it is. Whereas actually for storytellers, there are an infinite number of stories spiraling off in all directions. And that is such a provocation to get excited and to get celebratory and to think about, but this is amazing because if there are all these stories, then there is a version of the story that is going to speak to everybody. We don't all have to agree on one story if we are able to agree that actually there's this whole constellation of stories and somewhere in there is going to be the one that speaks to us and that represents us. So I think multiplicity and fluidity are such important concepts when thinking about myth and identity and nation. Because the moment there's one story, it's game over. We've already excluded a whole bunch of people. William Blake's Jerusalem is so tied up to English identity. It's literally our unofficial national anthem. I wanted to learn more about Blake's vision of England and his multiple uses of Albion. Professor Jason Whittaker has written extensively on William Blake. His most recent book, published in 2022, is titled Jerusalem, Blake, Parry and the Fight for Englishness. I asked him to shed some light on Blake's motives and how we have used his work in the creation of our own national identity. So back when Blake was was writing it, what do you think Jerusalem is about? So one level for me, having spent so long reading and studying Blake, there's a very, very easy answer to this, which, which again is a surprise to most people, but it's to go back to where Blake publishes it. And he publishes it as a preface to a poem called Milton, a poem, and it's one of his long epic works that he he writes and engraves and self-publishes in the early 19th century. And Milton, a poem, the, the, the main poem is incredibly bizarre in a typical Blakean way, in which it, it starts with Milton in heaven being deeply, you know, he's, he's got to heaven, he's got to his, his heart's ambition, and he's deeply dissatisfied, because in heaven he realises that he's basically imprisoned himself in a, in, a, in a truncated vision of what the human imagination is possible of. So he has to re- descend to earth. And he also has to descend to earth to reclaim his feminine part, which, you know, he kind of denounced and rejected. And also then to take control, to take responsibility for Satan. So, so there's this very strange psychobiography of Milton. Which, which Blake wrote in the early 19th century, in which he takes issue with Milton's politics, his religion, his ethical beliefs, his gender politics and everything. And as part of this, at the beginning, he added a preface. And the preface begins with an attack on Milton and Shakespeare for being seduced by classical literature. And, and the reason why this is particularly important to Blake is that this seduction um, which he finds prevalence um, in 18th century literature, the, the inheritors of Milton, is a predilection for, if you like, kind of the, the, the hero narrative, the, the story of the violent, brutal, bloody hero beginning with Homer's Iliad. And Blake, an interesting thing, I think Blake is almost unique as a writer at the time who completely rejects this classical worldview. He rejects the notion of a society based on hero worship. 
And so what's um, the, the preface begins as a, a denunciation of these this hero-worshipping militaristic society, which Blake says has prevailed into the 19th century, is driving the Napoleonic Wars. And against this, he wants to offer a vision based on his very explicit and particular Christian views of a world based on Christian love. And so Jerusalem, the, 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 the hymn Jerusalem, the poem, and did those feet with which he ends the preface, is an attempt to offer an alternative vision, one in which it is not a world of violence, it is not one which celebrates the powerful, um, but instead is building a, a, a land much more consonant with Blake's Christian virtues. So a common assumption is that the poem is about Jesus coming to, to, to England with yeah. Joseph of Arimathea. Blake knew nothing of that myth. Blake had no idea of that myth. That, that myth, that legend doesn't emerge until the end of the 19th century. The, the, the feet are Joseph of Arimathea. And the, the Jerusalem that Joseph of Arimathea builds is just spreading the Christian gospel. And that's what Blake wants to do with his poem. What is he trying to say about England in that poem? Or is he really just talking about this beautiful land? Or He's, he has a lot to say about England. I mean, as I say, a, a lot of my work over 30 years has dealt with Blake's varied approaches to national identity. Um, the, the fact that he named his principal character in his late works um, Albion <laughs> is, is immediately consonant. He, he's constantly thinking about the political nature of Britain and England. So uh, an important point to, to begin with, what, what he thinks about England, the country, starts from the fact that <laughs> I will not cease from mental fight nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. So the, a very simple starting point is that Jerusalem doesn't exist in England. It's If you take Jerusalem as a kind of symbolic, you know, the, the ideal heavenly city, it's not here. So a starting point, which I think is very often forgotten when people appreciate, you know, sing Jerusalem as a patriotic hymn, we're not there. We are not there. And Blake certainly, at the beginning of the 19th century, and this is very clear from his writing and art, he sees... England and Great Britain and the United Kingdom as dominated by the rich, the powerful, the corrupt, that there is uh, no care or concern for the poor, uh, that, if anything, <laughs> the England that he sees around him, and I'm going to use the word very carefully, so I'll need to explain it, he sees it as an almost satanic country. It is one ruled by greed, corruption. And I use that word satanic. What, what I'm being mean very specifically, a word that Blake would probably appreciate more, is Eurizen, Eurizenic. Eurizen is his famous figure from the ancient of days. So the, the picture of what people usually see as God reaching out with his compass to draw the universe. It's an incredible image. It's not God. The figure that Blake depicts there is Eurizen, a false deity, the God of this world. And he says repeatedly in his writings, Eurizen is Satan. Basically, Satan convinced us to worship him, to worship power, to worship strength, to worship wealth and all the rest of it. So that, that is the England that Blake sees all around him. And that is the England that Blake opposes, which is I say, utterly at odds with the way in which the hymn Jerusalem is usually used. It is almost completely antithetical to what Blake meant by his poem. Yeah, you mentioned a lot in your book as well that it has been nationalistically appropriated. Yes. And knowing that it is its original purpose was the complete opposite of that, why yes. do you think it lends itself so well to this interpretation? There's a long academic answer to that. So I'll try and keep this very brief. But what, one of the straightforward reasons to simplify is that the poem, because Blake's original setting, Milton, a poem, is very complicated. I mean, I... I've been studying Black for 30 years, and very often I still don't really know what he's talking about at times. He's a very complex poet. So, but but Anne did those feet, by contrast to the, the the prophetic epic that it's part of, is relatively simple to understand, you know, on a kind of semantic level in terms of what the words apparently mean. So it became detached from its context. It very importantly became detached from the context of a pacifist anti-war poem, which is what Blake was writing. Um, what then happens then? So it starts to circulate as a separate text. 
Um, and what then happens is, as it circulates separate texts, people are reading just these words and not the surrounding um, context by Blake. And it also then particularly starts to become anthologized. And it's these anthologists who start, you know, oh, this is a poem about England. This is a poem about patriotism. And they start sticking it in anthologies and they'll put it in sections, such as Robert Bridges in his collection in 2015, under England or under patriotism. So readers, their first and often only encounter with this poem is in a collection of poems that says, you know, this is a poem about patriotism. So that's why it becomes so fixed as that meaning. And, and I say this starts at the end of the 19th century. And, and it's actually it's a very small group of figures who all know each other. They're all related by marriage, etc. And, and they ultimately become the figures who determine this ultra patriotic, this ultra nationalist meaning of, of the hymn. But, but the, the, the Green and Pleasant Land was only appealed to two people. And it was this, there's an element where it's used to, to go back to, to the good old days. Over the course of sort of the conversations I've been having, there's been very much about the sort of origins of yes. the word, of the Albina myth, of the um, idea of a sort of creation myth for yes. England. In the context of, of your work and what you're doing, what does Albion mean? The, the, the context of work that I've done, is very specifically around Blake's use of that term. And Blake uses Albion extensively. Um, sometime at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, Blake starts to focus upon Albion as the primary exemplar of what he's trying to do. Mm. Um, and, and this is almost certainly a reaction to the events of the French Revolution. So Blake is a very politically motivated poet. So, so Albion operates three levels. He is an individual. There's an actual figure, Albion in Blake's words, a char character, which has its roots in those myths of the ancient giants that Brutus defeated and overthrew in, in um, Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain. He's also a country. He is literally, uh, Blake writes about it at the end of um, Milton, a poem. He, he has this incredible scene where Albion is starting to awake and the land is literally rising. In it. But his foot is on Cornwall. He's kind of, his one elbow is leaning across to Ireland, etc. So he, he literally creates this geographical entity as a kind of um, mythical figure. And then the third level is that the Albion is a cosmological entity. It's, I don't like using the word, but he's a god. He's an eternal. He is this kind of supernatural figure that fills the universe. And what Blake is motivated by here is, is writings of figures such as Jakob Burma and other mystics, the notion that, you know, as above, so below, the internal universe corresponds to the external universe. So Albion on, on this level is, is functioning as a, a spiritual conduit between an individual entity and the universe. And if Blake had been born in Japan, you know, it wouldn't have been Albion, it would have been Nihon or something like that. If he'd been born in, you know, Germany or, or South America, he would have seen these entities as a, as a representative of that, that region. Coming on to the specifics, what surprises I think a lot of people is that when they start reading Blake is that Blake's vision of Albion is very sceptical. Blake's depiction of Albion is closer to the perfidious Albion. Blake, Albion has turned his back on the world. Albion has closed himself off. Albion has become unchristian. <laughs> and it's kind of, you, you always hope that the UK is going to get better than that, but unfortunately not, as we can see at the moment. Um, so that the Albion that Blake depicts is of a fallen country, a country that is very hostile to those outside, is, is hostile to the poor, is, is, is effectively turned its back on the Gospels and Christianity. Even in his first uses of it. Yes. So, so Albion as a figure comes to the fore in sometime between 1797 and 1803 in a, in a manuscript he kept revising called Vala or the Four Zoas. Albion becomes a central figure. Before that, Blake talks about Albion and he's utterly sceptical. I mean, Albion, it, there's not even any nuance Albion or Albion's angel, as he calls him, is basically George III, is, is, a, is a tyrant. Albion, Blake is, is very much on the side of the American revolutionaries, of the French revolutionaries. He sees Albion as a symbol of dictatorship. As he gets older, he starts to add nuance here. He sees, you know, okay, Albion, Albion is fallen, but fallen figures can rise. You know, the whole point of Blake's kind of um, Christianity is that anybody can be saved. 
if they, you know, just learn to love others. So, so if anything, Blake becomes softer in his attitudes towards Albion. In, in the 18th century, he is very much, he's a, a radical who is very much opposed to any simplistic nationalist vision. He, he's, he, you know, Al, and ultimately the, the role for Albion is to become the eternal man by returning to his proper place amongst all the other Eternals. It, Albion, Albion in Blake's work has tried to become like Eurizen. He's, he's the false god who says, I'm the only god, you've got to worship me. You've got to do everything I say. Gosh, he would really hate the way we've taken it then. He would, he would. Do you think there's any way we can use Blake's vision of Albion and Englishness and talk about it in a in a hopeful way uh, absolutely <laughs> otherwise uh, i mean for, for me that's kind of a life's work so yeah sure so yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I, I mean that the, the the issue is when i'm speaking about jerusalem we return to that for example mm. people don't listen to the hymn they don't listen to the words they don't think about the words it's just become a meme it's just something that circulates with a very simple interpretation so by actually by by showing different ways that it's been used by different people who sing it, um, I just try to get people to listen to what it means. You know, okay, if we're going to build Jerusalem, what does that actually mean? And and for me, I say the theme of England's green and pleasant land is actually a really pointed one there. What's your favourite part of the poem? Um, I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Um, it's an astonishing. I, I mean, this was a guy who nobody knew, you know, hardly anybody read him. And just that sheer confidence and vision is incredible. And you called the epilogue of your book Albion. Albion, yes. What kind of note do you, do you sort of end that? Why, why did you choose Albion to end that on? So Albion is, it's actually, it's a slightly, it's frankly an ambivalence conclusion because I, I started writing that in the post-Brexit vote, which I was, very unhappy about. It seemed very unblaking in many respects. And I do start with a, a degree of nostalgia. It, it's a sense for what's lost. So, so what I draw attention to is the fact that, that the biggest change that's taken place for, I think, English society and indeed industrial Western and global society, it took place in the 20th century. That was the period when we stopped living in smaller you know, the majority of people then move from small towns and villages into cities. It's the great break. So, so there's an element in which I guess I am nostalgic. There's, there's a comment from Derek Jarman where he talks about radical conservatives in the sense of a lot of people like Pasolini, etc. We're always looking back to, to better days. And I think there is an element whereby I do not believe that we have automatically progressed in lots of things. It's not that, you know, we leave the cities and go back to the countryside. Uh, but that technological progress, as is very clear from things like climate change, etc., is not automatically for the benefit of the planet. Um, so so that I kind of end with this notion, drawing attention to the fact that the 20th century has seen the most radical change in human history. But, but ultimately, it's a very democratic vision. And this is why Brexit was actually quite important, that we have to, rather than manipulate public opinion to change the world, we are the public and we have to change the world. And that's that's a final point to make about Albion. Blake, I, I've mentioned Albion as an individual, a country, and a kind of universal man. Blake also makes clear that that, that point, Albion as a country, as a, as a landmass, is also a population. Albion is a people, and the people then have to make those changes as well. found both Steffi and Jason really inspiring in their ways of uh, sort of creating work and thinking about the uses of Albion now, um, whether it's the sort of the political history side uh, that Jason touches on with his sort of history of Britain through the lens of Blake or the sort of creation of new work to give England a sort of new origin myth, really, um, that Steffi's working on. How did you find listening to that back? I, I I really loved listening back to it, Rachel. It was totally a privilege to hear the conversations that you had and kind of go on the journey with you learning about Albion and then reflect back on um, on how it changed my understanding of Albion and all the work that we're doing at Dash over the next couple of years. Because I think I'd always understood 
Albion as another expression of Englishness, like another idea of what it is to be English. Um, and I think some of the things that I heard when you when I was listening to back to the to the to the interviews that the conversations that you've had over the last couple of months, I really loved hearing Carolyn talking about uh, Albion being this sort of um, this kind of legendary his heritage for England that like any, anyone can project, project their own fantasies into Albion and make it and make it make what they want of it I sort of love that and it really spoke to I suppose what we're trying to do with the public house in terms of thinking about new versions of ourselves and creating our own legends and so I really enjoyed that but I don't think what I what I realized as I was listening to that conversation with Carolyn obviously Steph's Steph, as you say, Steph's interpretations of how, how she understands and interprets Albion today and particularly Jason's read. I loved, I loved Jason's read about that, um, that Blake felt that England was for the rich, that it was ruled by greed and corruption and we needed Albion to kind of create a new country. And just that sense that the kind of, the, the, the sense that it's been interpreted as this great, that Jerusalem is interpreted as this great story about patriotism. But I also really loved the, that blur, the blurriness of Albion as a person and a place and a people and a spirit. I think what 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 I was really thinking about when I was listening back to the podcast and reflecting on it on it and its work today for Dash was that it Malbian is a made up legendary past and a fallen present and a like and a kind of a, a, a utopian possible future where which we can build together and it, it, it's all of those things it's sort of timeless in that way and it made me think not only not only does it speak to the public house that I think I talked about um I talked about earlier in the a few months ago with you. And I think we've talked about it in the podcast, but um, we're doing so many other projects at the moment at Dash where we're, we're dreaming of other ways to understand the world in which we live and imagining other ways to live in that world. And the fact that Albion can be this place of fictitious pasts and troubled presents and hopeful futures um, seemed sort of perfect. And it made me realise that actually we can extend that title of Albion really almost to include every work, whether it's about kind of English identity or about international ideas and questions about the nature of art and climate activism and all sorts of other projects that we're developing. It could be this season of work that is a catch-all for all of our dreams. So I'm grateful to you for sort of opening that up for me and helping me to understand a different way of interpreting Albion for Dash. Thank you. I um, have to say this has been one of my favourite ones to work on. It's And it's been, you know, over the course of months that I've sort of researched these people and had these conversations. And I think for me, it's the the sense, I mean, to coin sort of Steffi, like the multiplicity of it. It's the, the aspirational element of it that um, I really love. I, I always thought of it before as, as this place that had been. But actually, you know, no one has ever lived in Albion, like it's it's the idea of this um, fictitious legendary past and a sort of inspirational, aspirational future. And this reality that life is it's not going to, I was about to swear, I'd like I restrain myself, but life is seriously hard at the moment for so many people. Yeah. And Albion also reflects that. It's not perfect. Life is really far from perfect and nor was Albion. Thank you. I want to thank you, Rachel, because this is your last podcast for Dash. I'm glad it, I'm glad the last one was also your favourite <laughs> to make. Um, but I've loved working with you. I've loved working with you as, kind of, as podcast producer and, a, and an occasional podcast host of the podcast. And I can't wait to see what you do next um, with Dash and beyond in other projects and other work that you do because you're you know, you've been a phenomenal colleague and inspiration for Dash for so many of us. Thank you. It's been a, a real pleasure doing this series and I've learned so, so much from it. Um, so I want to thank you, obviously. I also want to thank uh, all my speakers today, Carolyn Larrington, uh, Steffi Harrop and Jason Whitaker for taking the time to talk to me. They were amazing, obviously, and um, I really appreciate it. If you like this podcast, please like and follow us, leave a review. It really helps us um, to stay visible and see you again soon.